Good evening, good evening. Welcome to today's edition, the live under the spotlight, Jamaica under the spotlight. But today it's not just about Jamaica. It's about some of our ancient uh, people, the people from who dwelt or lived in that place they called Egypt and the things that they gave to the world and the way they lost a lot of what they produced and what they created and what they imagined was lost. I just want to say before I go in further, so I want to say welcome to everyone who will come upon this live. I crave your indulgence in saying if you like the program to hit that like, that thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, make a comment and hit that notification bell. Yeah, sometimes in the past I forgot to mention it, but hit the notification bell and so that when I come on, you will be notified. So try to remember it this time, hit the notification bell. I am going to open the program with a small clip of an introductory clip of the program. I hope you like it and I'll be right back behind it, all right? All right, welcome back. Yeah, sorry, boy, well, that went by fast. Just sending out a, a few invites. And I wanna say again, welcome. Thank you for joining me. I hope we can, I'll be able to do the best job I can to produce a good program. Um, welcome. I am here, we're gonna be taking a look at how things were, what happened, what and how did the kings of the great Egyptian civilization, what happened, what, what brought an end to the, I wanna I want say the Africans being the, the big um, people who were responsible for that great civilization, what really happened, where, did things fall apart because apparently things fall apart. And, you know, if we look out throughout history, we we'll see many empires have come and many empires have gone. Even the ones we are seeing today, which sometimes they posture like they are forever. You know, we, you know, each step of man in this thing called life, the experience that we go through, each step, we have seen people asserting themselves establishing their or making their their mark on the on on history but each of them each step along the way somebody has had to or have had some people have had to step back and give you know give the the, the, the front the lead to different people you know we, we there was a, the first the first civilization then was on the african continent we saw where um, Ethiopia was there, then Egypt came. We've not, we have not been hearing much about these places such as Kush, you know, and the Nubians, and the, well, the Nubians are the people, but the Kushite empire was a big empire. I think the Nubian was a big empire too. And the Egyptian empire was big and strong, but then came along other empires. And, you know, each time one come to overthrow the other, they do the other. They, things are so weird now that, we're not even sure what it will look like after a conquest. But when there's a, a conquest, the, conquer, the conqueror takes the spoils. They take whatever and they write the story. So this is what we're gonna to try to do this evening to look at um, what happened to Egypt and what happened to the, the great pharaohs. The person we, who will call on this evening to help us to Take a peek in, because I can't do all of it. I'm taking from a book 
by a man. I did this some time ago in the past, but I thought I still needed to come back to it. And I promised, kept promising on this evening. I say, you know what? This is as good as any other time, as any time to present, present this program. Because it feels like it is a good spin-off to the program I did last week, you know, where we went down the road to say what happened, what is happening between uh, Vladimir Putin and this thing of revealing these icons from biblical times, you know, people like Jesus and Moses and, you know, Mary and all those other things. And so it felt right that I should go back in that area, but we're looking at Egypt because during those time of Jesus, Egypt prom, um, figured prominently. And so I'm going to do a little introduction so I can go out and and, um, and um, invite some friends. All right. So here we go. Listen to this. This is an introduction of the book. Oh, by the way, the book, the name of this book I'm taking from this evening, it's called The Stolen Legacy. And the stolen legacy is the stolen legacy of the Egyptian, what Egyptians created. And some people grabbed it and put their own names and labels and stamps and everything in it. And, as, and they have claimed it to be their own. But George, this, this gentleman, he, he his, his name is George G. M. Beckford. And he has done such a great job of it. The weirdest thing with him, after he wrote this book and after it was published, he died shortly after. You know, I need to do some research into it to say exactly how he died, whether it was a violent death or a natural death or whatever. But he didn't live long after he wrote this book. And this book has like just torn the cover off all the, a lot of lies, and a lot of misinformation, a lot of, you know, false, you know, false, Hoods, people claiming things to be their own when it is not so. So this evening we're going to use George Beckford to tell us what he has found in his ritual, in his research. This book was actually done, you know, maybe like 60 years ago now. And so now we're using him, we're leaning on him this evening to use his work to present it. He gave it to us, he left, left it behind for us to, to read, and I'm trying to help to shed light on it. All right, so listen to this until I get right back. Must be borne in mind that the first lesson in the humanities is to make a people aware of their contributions to civilization. And the second lesson is to teach them about other civilizations. By this dissemination of the truth about the civilization of individual peoples, a better understanding among them and a proper appraisal of each other should follow. This notion is based upon the notion of the great mastermind. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Consequently, the book is an attempt to show that the true authors of Greek philosophy were not the Greeks, but the people of North Africa commonly called the Egyptians, and the praise and honor falsely given to the Greeks for centuries belonged to the people of North Africa, and therefore to the African continent. Consequently, this theft of the African legacy by the Greeks led to the erroneous world opinion that the African continent has made no contribution to civilization and that its people are naturally backward. This is the misrepresentation that has become the basis of race prejudice, which has affected all people of color. For centuries, the world has been misled about the original source of the arts and sciences. For centuries, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle have been falsely idolized as models of intellectual greatness. And for centuries, the African continent has been called the dark continent because Europe coveted the honor of transmitting to the world the arts and sciences. I am happy to be able to bring this information to the attention of the world so that on one hand, all races and creeds might know the truth and free themselves from those prejudices which have corrupted human relations. And on the other hand, that the people of African origin might be emancipated from their serfdom of inferiority complex and enter upon a new era of freedom in which they would feel like free men with full human rights and privileges. The Stolen Legacy. Introduction. Characteristics of Greek Philosophy. The term Greek philosophy, to begin with, is a misnomer, for there is no such philosophy in existence. The ancient Egyptians had developed a very complex religious system called the Mysteries, which was also the first system of salvation. As such, it regarded the human body as a prison house of the soul, which could be liberated from its bodily impediments through the disciplines of the arts and sciences, and advanced from the level of a mortal to that of a god. This was the notion of the summum bonum, or greatest good, to which all men must aspire. 
and it also became the basis of all ethical concepts. The Egyptian mystery system was also a secret order, and membership was gained by initiation and a pledge to secrecy. The teaching was graded and delivered orally to the neophyte, and under these circumstances of secrecy, the Egyptians developed secret systems of writing and teaching and forbade their initiates from writing what they had learned. After nearly 5,000 years of prohibition against the Greeks, they were permitted to enter Egypt for the purpose of their education, first through the Persian invasion, and secondly through the invasion of Alexander the Great. From the 6th century BC, therefore, to the death of Aristotle, 322 BC, the Greeks made the best of their chance to learn all they could about Egyptian culture. Most students received instructions directly from the Egyptian priests, but after the invasion by Alexander the Great, the royal temples and libraries were plundered and pillaged. An Aristotle school converted the library at Alexandria into a research center. There is no wonder, then, that the production of the unusually large number of books ascribed to Aristotle has proved a physical impossibility for any single man within a lifetime. The history of Aristotle's life has done him far more harm than good, since it carefully avoids any statement relating to his visit to Egypt, either on his own account or in the company of Alexander the Great when he invaded Egypt. The silence of history at once throws doubt upon the life and achievements of Aristotle. He is said to have spent 20 years under the tutorship of Plato, who is regarded as a philosopher. Yet he graduated as the greatest of scientists of antiquity. Two questions might be asked. A. How could Plato teach Aristotle, which he himself did not know? B. Why should Aristotle spend 20 years under a teacher from whom he could learn nothing? This bit of history sounds incredible. Again, in order to avoid suspicion over the extraordinary number of books ascribed to Aristotle, history tells us that Alexander the Great gave him a large sum of money to get the books. Here again, the history sounds incredible. And three statements must here be made. A. In order to purchase books on science, they must have been in circulation so as to enable Aristotle to secure them. B. If the books were in circulation before Aristotle purchased them, and since he is not supposed to have visited Egypt at all, then the books in question must have been circulated among Greek philosophers. C. If circulated among Greek philosophers, then we would expect the subject matter of such books to have been known before Aristotle's time, and consequently, he could not be credited either with producing them or introducing new ideas of science. Another point of considerable interest to be accounted for was the attitude of the Athenian government towards this so-called Greek philosophy, which it regarded as foreign in origin and treated it accordingly. Only a brief study of history is necessary to show that Greek philosophers were undesirable citizens who, throughout the period of their investigations, were victims of relentless persecution at the hands of the Athenian government. Anaxagoras was imprisoned in exile, Socrates was executed, Plato was sold into slavery, and Aristotle was indicted and exiled, while the earliest of them all, Pythagoras, was expelled from Croton in Italy. Can we imagine the Greeks making such an about turn as to claim the very teachings which they had at first persecuted and openly rejected? Certainly they knew they were usurping what they had never produced. And as we enter step by step into our study, the greater do we discover evidence which leads us to the conclusion that Greek philosophers were not the authors of Greek philosophy, but the Egyptian priests and hierophants. Okay, the Egyptian priests and hieroglyphs. Um, those are the people who created the, the images. You know, when you go to um, maybe like if you ever get a chance to go into Egypt and there are, are, there are a lot of drawings on the walls and not just the walls, but the remnants of the great structures that were um, erected, built, constructed by the Egyptians. And uh, they have a lot of you know, symbols and hieroglyphs on those things and you have people who specialize in reading them because that was a language that was a writing of the day in, in the, and you're talking about thousands of years ago and leading up to a few hundred years before Christ well they um they they, 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 they in the previous times they used to call it CE the common era that everybody would try to use as a measure, the yardstick, the measuring stick, the starting point of things. And so um, those, those information are still there. A lot of it is still there. Men go there, people are constantly there studying and reading it and seeing what they're seeing and they try to bury it and they try to hide it, but it doesn't, it has not, they have not managed to wipe it clean because there are enough evidence 
to say um, what they're saying, you know, what they try to present to us is, uh, as Rachel Mother likes to say, bull pucky. As she used to say that, she used to like to use that term. It's bull pucky. A lot of it is bull pucky. And so we are here um, looking at it and using Mr. Beckford, George, George G. M. Beckford, if you want to um, research the book and look up the book, you, you can be bought. And this is an older book, but you can get it on Amazon, of course. And the name of the book is The Stolen Legacy. It's one of the greatest books I've read. And I, you know, I, I listen to this book more often than any other book that I've ever read. Um, for those who don't have time to sit around much anymore, to just sit and read a book, you know, the, the audio version is there and it's nicely presented and it's well read. So you can go out and research it. I'm going to do try to do another program of it because this is just scratching the surface of what I'm going to do this evening. And um, the clips, sometimes they can be a little lengthy, so I don't want to bore and drag it out too much and bore it about it too much. But if you will try to go along with it, try to understand it, and try to learn from it, because it's your history, it's my history, it's anybody of the African descent history. And what we're, what we're trying to do is to try to help ourselves to pull back and dig back and to claw back and to reach back reach back and look into our past and to say where did we come from who are we why is it that sometimes we ex you know just present this very brilliant people and in another way we're just beaten down to, to rebe you know get into some strange behaviors and that's because as, as i like to say all of these greatness still lie on our um, dna it's lying on the genes waiting to wake up anytime we give it a chance. Anytime we, we start to just scratch the surface and look, we will find it. Now, in, these, in this book, you will hear a lot of names being called. For some people who well, has never gone through a, a class or some kind of studies where you study about philosophy, these are some of the common names that we'll hear being called. You'll hear, you'll hear Plato, you'll hear Socrates, you'll hear um, um, well, no, I said, Lady Socrates and, and, and um, a bunch of them. The names will come to me. But they, these are the people who establish themselves to say that they are philosophers and that they are mathematicians and that they are astronomers and that they are, you know, geologists and, you know, all kinds of, you know, great scientists but each time when somebody goes to check them out there is no record of them there, there, there's no record of where they went to school now the thing about egypt egypt at, at, at a point in time long before anything named the united states even before a lot of europe was developed egypt was there thriving and it 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 has a dynasty of 31 dynasties and you know the continuation of um what we call pharaohs are kings king after king after king and king and king, and king added up uh, 31 dynasties some of them will last 20 years some probably 30 years some very short less than a year even because within those societies within those kingdoms there are always people who are finding and searching for ways to bounce one person off so they can get in. And so we have all of these dynasties and, you know, along the way, but um, the, the way it was in, in those times, you had people were constantly waging wars against each other. Wars were coming from outside and wars were coming from inside. People are constantly trying to overthrow and to, to conquer. You know, it was the way of the world, you know, and it's still that way. You know, we, we you know, we, up to recent time when we went through this thing called colonialism and then, you know, into a period of called imperialism. And, you know, because people are always trying to rule over the next one for whatever reason. And so it, it was no different back in those days when Egypt was, you know, a mighty kingdom, when Egypt had the, 
the, the, the universities. Egypt was the place where people would leave from any part of the earth, wherever a person, it would be um, taught or told that why do you, you know if you ever have you ever been to Egypt? If you go to Egypt, you they have these schools and they teach you these just mind-boggling kinds of things that they teach you: sciences, medicine, mathematics, astronomy, astrology, all of them, algebra, all of it, all of it. They were doing it there. They created it. But here, what happened now? One day, there's a period when Egypt came under, you know, constant pressure from outside first it was you know you had the greeks and then you had the 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 the, the, the rome the romans and 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 then you had the, you know like um the persians and the people from turkey which was another thing and um and so it was constant constant you know a constant struggle to to keep your whatever you had because people were constantly coming and when they come into your space, when they take over, when they capture, when they conquer, they take what you have. And they, they will take, look for books, they would look for gold, they would look for precious, uh, um, whatever things that you have. If you're in a religious thing, you would have your goblets and things that you use to pray to your God or give sacrifice to the God. And they would see those things as having value. And they would try to cart away anything, especially your gold and precious stones and all those things because they would take it back to their societies and to build themselves up. You now Egypt came under such one such situation where Egypt, as I said before, was a was a place where people left up from all corners of the earth to come to study. And of course the things they were teaching, others never knew it before. In fact, Greece which became known as the center of philosophy, it was illegal to study philosophy in Greece at that time. And, and to the point where guys would have to run away and hide. You know, one of the great ones, Socrates, he was executed for it. He chose some kind of poison. And 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 he he paid the price that way. He wanted to go for whatever reason. He never his friends could have, you know, sprung him or taken him away and to freedom. But he felt that maybe he had lived out his life and he didn't care no more. And he just drank the poison and and he passed. And so he is one that we celebrate as the great Socrates. But in truth and in fact. Socrates was one of those people who went to Egypt, got the teachings in Egypt, and, and took what he could take from Egypt. Because when Alexander the Great, so-called, I like to say the so-called Great, well, at the time, you know, when you could overthrow, say, an, uh, an Egypt, you would have been considered as great because these were not small armies. These were not pushover armies. These were powerful armies. But Man, in, is it just the way today we are constantly studying warfare and we are constantly developing new weapons, new weapons of mass destruction? It's the same way back in those days. People are constantly coming up with new ways. And the, the ones who come up with the new ideas are the new strategy or a new way of, of warfare. You are the one. And if it is effective and the other side doesn't have what you have, you could you, in those days you, you easily overpowered the next side. So, after many of maybe centuries of people trying to overthrow the Egyptian system, eventually a man came around named Alexander, and Alexander conquered conquered um, Egypt. Now Alexander is from between Greece and Italy. And and you know those are there were, those were the powers at, at the at, you know next set of powers at the time, and what Alexander did was to cart away a lot of the treasures, a lot of the out of Egypt. You know, it took away whatever they could take away. Took away the books because they had books. They were writing. They had libraries. I just want to make mention to say one of the ways they, they the thing that they they, they they what they we would consider religion is the, the, the kind of religion that they practiced in Egypt 
at the time is what they call the Egyptian mysteries. And the mysteries are similar, very similar, which not the same, I think the same as you see men practice today in what they call lodges, because that's where the lodge movement started in Egypt, because they studied over centuries. And, and in developing over centuries, they had things about, they knew things about man that they could use and to whether it be for healing or for building or for, because, you know, whatever it is. Because remember, Egypt was building. And as we go into the program, we're going to hear some numbers called of the size of some of these structures that they built. Remember, back in those thousands of years before Christ, you didn't have cranes that could lift massive boulders. But these people have figured a way out how to lift huge 10, 20 ton boulders and pile them on top of each other and on top of each other and build great monuments. One of the things you hear them talk, they talk about that thing is hundreds of or thousands of tons heavy and tall. And, and this, 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 the ceiling within a building was so 36 feet tall. You wonder how they managed to do these things. But because of the mysteries, they learned, they studied, there were things were revealed to them. And they used it and built things that was not seen anywhere else in the world. Everybody else has now tried to copy them over the time. But that's where it comes from. Let me go to another clip so I can, you know, give a different sound to this. All right? We'll do this. Educated the Greeks. One, the effects of the Persian conquest. A, immigration restrictions against the Greeks are removed and Egypt is thrown open to Greek research. Owing to the practice of piracy, in which the Ionians and Carians were active, the Egyptians were forced to make immigration laws restricting the immigration of the Greeks and punishing their infringement by capital punishment, i.e. the sacrifice of the victim. Before the time of Semiticus, the Greeks were not allowed to go beyond the coast of Lower Egypt, but during his reign and that of Amasis, those conditions were modified. For the first time in Egyptian history, Ionians and Carians were employed as mercenaries in the Egyptian army. 670 BC. Interpretation was organized through a body of interpreters, and the Greeks began to gain useful information concerning the culture of the Egyptians. In addition to these changes, King Amasis removed the restrictions against the Greeks and permitted them to enter Egypt and settle in Nacratus. About the same time, i.e. the reign of Amasis, the Persians, through Cambyses, invaded Egypt and the whole country was thrown open to the researches of the Greeks. B. The Genesis of Greek Enlightenment. The Persian invasion did not only provide the Greeks with ample research, but stimulated the creation of prose history in Ionia. Heretofore, the Greeks had little or no accurate knowledge of Egyptian culture, but their contact with Egypt resulted in the genesis of their enlightenment. C. Students from Ionia and the islands of the Aegean visit Egypt for their education. Just as in our modern times, countries like the United States, England, and France are attracting students from all parts of the world on account of their leadership and culture. So it was in ancient times. Egypt was supreme in leadership of civilization, and students from all parts flocked to that land, seeking admission into her mysteries or wisdom system. The immigration of Greeks into Egypt for the purpose of their education began as a result of the Persian invasion, 525 BC, and continued until the Greeks gained possession of that land and access to the royal library through the conquest of Alexander the Great. Alexandria was converted into a Greek city, a center of research, and the capital of a newly created Greek empire under the rule of the Ptolemies. Egyptian culture survived and flourished under the name and control of the Greeks until the edicts of Theodosius in the 4th century AD and that of Justinian in the 6th century AD, which closed the mystery temples and schools as elsewhere mentioned. Concerning the fact that Egypt was the greatest education center of the ancient world, which was also visited by the Greeks, reference must again be made to Plato in the Timaeus, who tells us that Greek aspirants to wisdom visited Egypt for initiation, and that the priests of Sais used to refer to them as children in the mysteries. As regards the visit of Greek students to Egypt for the purpose of their education, the following are mentioned simply to establish the fact that Egypt was regarded as the educational center of the ancient world and that like the Jews, the Greeks also visited Egypt and received their education. All right. And as you can see, everybody, everybody in the earth got your teachings 
whether it was directly at the time when it was happening or from the books that were written, you know, all of these theorems that you hear about, the Pythagoras theorems, these guys, one of the things that I'm not sure if it'll come up in one of these clips, but the thing about these people, and I think I mentioned before, there's no trace of where they got where they, where they got started. They will just pop up over Europe, all over Europe. They'll just pop up and 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 present themselves as mathematicians, or as astronomers, or all kind of scientists, and you know, because they got the books and they were able to transcribe from the Egyptian language into whatever the language they spoke, whether it be Greek or, or, or you know, um, what they call Latin, or I'm not, I've not seen it yet where the, the English speaking world, because they learned English even, you know, the, in the Anglo Saxon world, English developed over many, many years, many, maybe a couple, several centuries, because the way they used to speak it was like now with the, the sentence structures and all those kind of, you know, nice sounding things. It used to be a kind of very broken kind of English they used to speak in the early days, and it developed. So some words are Spanish, some it might be German, some it's French, some it, you know, all Portuguese, all kind of language thing mixed up in that English thing. So they don't figure so much in that period. They, they what them call themselves the Normans in the early days. They never came into the existence yet. So, but the the Italians with Latin, um, the Greeks were there, of course. The Spanish was there, yeah, the, the, because um, after long after Egypt itself, where, where you had, you know, the, this other civilization which took over, you know, Europe and mainly in Spain, they established universities in Spain and uh, the Moors, they established universities in Spain because they were coming from that same area, that same section of of. Um, of Africa, North Africa, which is um, Egypt. So it was either Egypt or Timbuktu, which is, you know, um, I think it's part of Sudan, Sudan, you know, and then even some of the Mali and those places. That's where some of these things came from. And and um, and so they, these people, these Europeans, they would go there, they would learn it, and they would come back to their their, their countries and to disseminate the the knowledge and and so so even one of the we, we those who have done some some um history and you hear about the in in um, egypt the ptolemic the ptolemic um period or dynasty the ptolemic dynasty i you know i was doing some some research on ptolemy and ptolemy is one of those guys who just showed up out of nowhere Having all of these great knowledge of, you know, he was like, they say he was an Egyptian astronomer, mathematician, geographer, um, and um, I think but what I found with Ptolemy, Ptolemy is a Euro of European extract, but he studied in Egypt. And he's the one who is accredited for a lot of the things that we do today, you know, a lot of the way. Uh, the, in terms of astronomy, but what happened? He was apparently born in, in, in Egypt. He studied in the because they had universities. They, you know, after a while, even when the Greeks took over, and between them and the, the, the Italians or the Romans, you know, they were, they were never called Italians at the time, they were like Romans. And when they were, when they took over, you could go to the schools. And, and so people like a Ptolemy, he went there, and so they called the period that he started sprouting these things as the, his, his family, the Ptolemy, the Ptolemies, were once, one, one of them was his father, grandfather was one of the, for lack of a uh, better thing now, he was one of the pharaohs because some, after a while they called themselves, even the, even the Europeans who stepped in there, um, which is like the, the, this, this lady, Cleopatra, and her, I think her father was, I think her father was Alexander, uh, Alexander, I think his, her father was. They had their, they two made themselves into pharaohs, because pharaoh is a title like king. And and um, and so they, they two had, you know, left their mark on the thing. See, they said, they, they said they, um, the title pharaoh is used for those rulers 
of ancient Egypt who ruled after the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt because there was a time when Egypt was um, split into Upper and Lower Egypt. And, and they said, um, uh, so during the, the early dynasty period, approximately 3,100 BC, 3,100 years before Christ, when these people started, you know, these dynasties started. And in, throughout the time, there were 31 of these dynasties. And, they, and so um, this Ptolemy man, he is one of them who developed a name out of it, and they call it, and the, the family name, they call it the Ptolemaic dynasty. That was a period, and that's when Europeans were in, in charge of the thing. And let me see it here. Um, oh, by the way, before I go any further, before I, I want to do a little bit more um, reading on this. I want to tell you, say to everyone who is here, who will join, who will join later, who will hear this program, I want to say thank you for joining, and I want to invite you to please like this program if you do. And, you know, give it a thumbs up. If you have a comment, please, a comment will be great. And, of course, subscribe to the channel because the channel is growing and it only grows when people like yourself who will hear it and will try, join on to it. The only time you'll hear it is when, you know, you participate and do something. And I just want to say thank you. I want to thank all of those people last week. I tell you, when I, I was, like, pleasantly surprised the amount of, you know, participation that people part not they didn't just come on and just look for a minute but they participated right throughout and left some good comments and, and it encouraged me a lot so i hope this week people will find this one just as valuable because you know we every part of the earth we have come to learn that you know some names and to say these are the people who gave us whatever we got and later on we are coming to find out that this wasn't true and Ptolemy is one of those people who just showed up. They say Ptolemy was born 100 CE. That is the, the what they call the common era, um, period or era. era and, and he died 170, um, 170 CE. And, um, and he was an Egyptian astronomer. But actually... He was, I'll show you, I think I did capture a little something of him. Did I, I oh boy, I, think, I don't think I taken it down. Um, I didn't pull him in, but I should have. I know it's out there. But let me show you one of the um, the people, the, the one of the early, the, when I would say he could be the second to last, the man I will show you right now. He will be a, the second to last leader of, of um, um, of Egypt, after you know, just 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 before the conquest, because after he died, within six months after he died, somebody else was ruling then. But six months after he died, the place was overrun by Egypt. I want to show you his uh, a piece of broken thing with him, what he looked like, and his name was his name was uh, King Amasis, and as you can see, look at those features. Um, there's something distinct, but these things were built in the image of what they look like at the time. If you notice, they tended, the Europeans tended to knock off the nose of the, the statues or any, any um, rep, whatever, replica of, the, of things of the time. And one of them is a statue that they like to knock off the noses and they like to knock off the lips because this is what gives them away. To say this is what these people look like, and they try to hide it, and 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 so um, that is what it is. And his name is um, Amasis, Amasis, Amaxis. Sometimes they pronounce Amaxis. All right. So now we go back to this one. They say um, virtually. This is talking about Ptolemy. You now this man Ptolemy, who presented himself as this great philosopher, this great astronomer, this great mathematician. He's everything. I've never seen his everything. They said they never knew anything about him before. But here it is. They say virtually nothing is known about Ptolemy's life except what can be inferred from his writings. So he wrote some things and say he's one thing, but nobody ever knew him. You never saw him in anywhere doing any studies. And the place you would go to learn things is in Egypt. And he was able to write like maybe hundreds of books, but all he did was going and to transcribe 
put his name on it and say that's him. That's what that's what um Socrates did, that's what Plato did, that's an Anaxagoras did, that's what uh what the one that named Pythagoras did. All of them did this thing, attached themselves to the thing. And he said his first major astronomy, he, he claimed to have been an astronomy, you know, he, uh, and he said, no, he said he studied astronomy over 20 years. No, anybody who is into, if remember now, the only people who could have written something down about astronomy is the Egyptians. And when they did it, it took them hundreds of years to come to, to bring the, the thing together and to say, yeah, this is what it, this is what is going on. Because if we look at say an eclipse an eclipse which which is tomorrow but this eclipse takes place every 20 years if you got into studies in 20 years you're not going to be able to say how many the life the cycle that this next eclipse will take place with just within one lifetime it's kind of hard these people were able to tell it over hundreds of years or thousands of years when they studied it this is what happened because nothing has changed with the the moons the sun and the moon's relationship to each other. They, you know, the, the, one of them still go around the other. I think it was the, the, the earth goes around the, the thing and the earth is rotating in itself. And it, you know, and it takes 24 hours to go through the cycle and all that kind of stuff. And and so, you know, it, it, it this takes hundreds, if not thousands of years. And this is what the Egyptians did. And, you know, and they had this, what they call the, the mystery, the, the Egyptian mysteries which is what they studied everything about life. And they were able, even within their prayers, they were able to do what we call now miracles. Remember when Moses met the, um, when Moses actually grew up in the house of the Egyptians. But remember when Moses was sent, this is kind of a bit com, you know, uh, complicated because they said, yeah, Moses had, had run away from the Egyptians. But he himself grew up in the house of the Egyptians. So he's like an Egyptian. He knew all of the secrets. So when Moses went and he threw down his rod, the other guys, Egyptian guys, and he turned into a snake. The other guys threw down their rods too, and their snake, their rods turned into, into snakes too. So the Egyptians were the first to be to do this kind of, you know science thing but we, we, we would you want to call it necromancy or obia or whatever witchcraft some the europeans did end up calling it witchcraft but that is what is happening so there's a virtually nothing is known about ptolemy's life except what can be inferred from his writings his first major astronomical work the um alma guest was completed about 150 ce which is the the common era and contains reports of astronomical observations that Ptolemy had made over the preceding quarter of a century. He's going to give our kind of predictions with a 25, with just a 25 year observation to show you it's not true. You know, just alone can tell you this man is very fuzzy. Because nobody knows about him as any great astronomer. They've never seen him doing it anyway. But he come out with a book and a books saying he's an astronomer. And this is what he did. He was in Egypt. He, they said he was born in Egypt, he was born somewhere else and ended up in Egypt because after all, everybody was going into Egypt. And now, I just want to say right here, during the period, what I've come to realize that during, during the period of, of the, this, this, um, this dynasty and the overthrow of the Egyptian, you know, the, the original Egyptians, when they overthrew the place, um, Greece, was not even a, a full country. They have a joke. The, the, the Greeks and the Greek people have a joke that they say God created Greece by sifting some sand and the heavy, the heavy stones that were or the stones that were left behind, you threw it in the water, and that is what you know uh, creates Egypt. Because more if people who know um, Greece, not Egypt, but Greece, this is what created Greece. People who know Greece tell you that most of the land here is uninhabitable. It's just rocks. And, and, and so they said that the Greek people were wandering. They were kind of a wandering people. It's a wandering nation. Like they said, they are similar to what the, what the Jews went through. They were wandering people throughout the earth. The next, you know, um, there's another one, um, another European nation that they beat up all the while. They said that they, you know, these these are several of them that what the name is evading me right now. 
That is said they were like wandering people, and the Greeks are one of those people. The Jews, the Greeks, and and there's another name which will come to me shortly. Um, so they say he had made over the preceding uh, the size and content of his subsequent uh, literary production suggests that he lived until about 170 CE. Um, something is wrong with this date thing that they have here because as you come and well, I was thinking, I think it was BC, I was thinking about C is a different calculator um, way of looking at things. The book that is now generally known as the uh, Almagest from a hybrid of Arabic, notice in the, from a, a hybrid from Arabic and Greek, the greatest was called the Talmi, the Talmi, he mathematic syntaxis, the mathematical collection, because he believed that its subject, the motions of the heavenly body, could be explained in mathematical terms, the opening chapters. You see, he's taking it straight from the Egyptians because that's what they used to do. They used to study the movement of the, the planet, the stars and everything, and they would you know, come pull their, build their, um, their whatever, their findings into these teachings. And then he went and he grabbed it and presented it like it was his. Uh, as I said, he's presented empirical arguments for basic cosmological framework within which Ptolemy worked. Earth, he argued, is a stationary sphere at the center of the vastly larger celestial sphere that revolves at the perfectly uniform rate around. And, and you know, man has come to know that there's no such thing. That Earth itself is not, it, it, it rotates and it, it's constantly on the move. Um, but I'm not going to, I'm not here to go argue with um, Ptolemy this evening, just to point out that these one of the latest ones that if you look at his what he's writing is not making any sense if you do some research you would see that it, it, let me go to another clip because i don't want the evening to die, end and we didn't go through i've brought another one or two let's go and listen to this one until the greeks gained possession of that land and access to the royal library through the conquest of alexander the great alexandria was converted into a greek city a center of research and the capital of a newly created greek empire under the rule of the Ptolemies. Egyptian culture survived and flourished under the name and control of the Greeks until the edicts of Theodosius in the 4th century AD and that of Justinian in the 6th century AD, which closed the mystery temples and schools as elsewhere mentioned. Concerning the fact that Egypt was the greatest education center of the ancient world, which was also visited by the Greeks, reference must again be made to Plato in the Timaeus, who tells us that Greek aspirants to wisdom visited Egypt for initiation and that the priests of Sais used to refer to them as children in the mysteries. As regards the visit of Greek students to Egypt for the purpose of their education, the following are mentioned simply to establish the fact that Egypt was regarded as the educational center of the ancient world and that like the Jews, the Greeks also visited Egypt and received their education. One, it is said that during the reign of Amasis, Thales, who is said to have been born about 585 BC, visited Egypt and was initiated by the Egyptian priests into the mystery system and science of the Egyptians. We are also told that during his residence in Egypt, he learned astronomy, land surveying, mensuration, engineering, and Egyptian theology. Two, it is said that Pythagoras, a native of Samos, traveled frequently to Egypt for the purpose of his education. Like every aspirant, he had to secure the consent and favor of the priests, and we are informed by Diogenes that a friendship existed between Polycrates of Samos and Amasis, king of Egypt. That Polycrates gave Pythagoras letters of introduction to the king, who secured for him an introduction to the priests. First to the priests of Heliopolis, then to the priest of Memphis, and lastly to the priests of Thebes, to each of whom Pythagoras gave a silver goblet. We are also further informed through Herodotus, Jablonsk, and Pliny, that after severe trials, including circumcision, had been imposed upon him by the Egyptian priests, he was finally initiated into all their secrets, that he learned the doctrine of metempsychosis, of which there was no trace before in the Greek religion, that his knowledge of medicine and strict system of dietic rules distinguished him as a product of Egypt, where medicine had attained its highest perfection, and that his attainments in geometry corresponded with the ascertained fact that Egypt was the birthplace of that science. In addition, we have the statements of Plutarch, Demetrius, and Antisthenes that Pythagoras founded the science of mathematics among the Greeks, and that he sacrificed to the muses when the priests explained to him the properties of the right-angle triangle. 
Pythagoras was also trained in music by the Egyptian priests. Three, according to Diogenes Laertes and Herodotus, Democritus is said to have been born about 400 BC and to have been a native of Abdera in Miletus. We are also told by Demetrius in his treatise on, quote, people of the same name, end quote, and by Antisthenes in his treatise on succession, that Democritus traveled to Egypt for the purpose of his education and received the instruction of the priests. We also learn from Diogenes and Herodotus that he spent five years under the instruction of the Egyptian priests and that after completion of his education, he wrote a treatise on the sacred characters of Moreau. In this respect, we further learn from Origen that circumcision was compulsory and one of the necessary conditions of initiation to a knowledge of the hieroglyphics and sciences of the Egyptians. And it is obvious that Democritus, in order to obtain such knowledge, must have submitted also to that right. Origen, who was a native of Egypt, wrote as follows, quote, No one among the Egyptians either studied geometry or investigated the secrets of astronomy unless circumcision had been undertaken, end quote. Four, concerning Plato's travels, we are told by Hermodorus that at the age of 28, Plato visited Euclid at Megara in company with other pupils of Socrates, and that for the next 10 years, he visited Cyrene, Italy, and finally Egypt, where he received instruction from the Egyptian priests. Five, with regards to Socrates and Aristotle and the majority of the pre-Socratic philosophers, history seems to be silent on the question of their traveling to Egypt, like the few other students here mentioned, for the purpose of their education. It is enough to say that in this case, the exceptions have proved the rule that all students who had the means went to Egypt to complete their education. All right, good. So... <laughs> So you see, it, it, um, this James Beckford, um, well, his, his name is, yes, James Beckford, George, and they call him Jim Beckford. He put a lot of effort, a lot of work into producing this work. And you know, it might sound like it's something that is not important, but it is because this is, these things, are the building blocks, the foundation of where how the earth started, where the, the, the world started in developing knowledge and to you know science and, and, and everything. And, and so you know these people would go after after an event, a conquest, after, as I said before, they would just take over things and they would claim it and, and this is mine. And even even today when you look into Say World War One, World War Two, with the war between, say, Germany after after the conquest, after the overthrow of, of Hitler, a lot of these scientists, a lot of engineers, a lot of doctors, a lot of anybody with any value, and of course the money and all everything else that was involved that Germany had, a lot of it was taken away, carted away. Because people have to pay for the, the cost of fighting these wars, and when you take, when you get what you, you see what you see, and you take what you see, and you because you have to replenish your coffers and have make, of course, make yourself richer with these these treasures that you have taken away. So it's not new; it was always a situation. And so one of the things, uh, some of the things they used to take in their, in, they still do take. They will take the, the knowledge that was developed in that society. How people did things, how they figured out things. And when once they go there, one of the early things they look for is the libraries, is the it's the gold, it's the uh whatever the precious metals or stones or anything, they would grab that and take it off, take it away for themselves. They, some people would get things that was, you know, Egypt of itself would conquer different different societies and they would take things and bring it back. And so they would have things from other cultures and other societies that they overran and develop and say so i think my time is going real fast tonight and i'm not going to wait too long i want to play i think if i did that one i'm going to play two more clips i'm going to try to get travels we're told by hermodorus that at the age of 28 plato visited euclid at megara in company with other pupils of socrates and that for the next 10 years he visited cyrene italy and finally egypt where he received instruction from the egyptian priests Five, with regards to Socrates and Aristotle and the majority of the pre-Socratic philosophers, history seems to be silent on the question of their traveling to Egypt like the few other students here mentioned.
for the purpose of their education. It is enough to say that in this case, the exceptions have proved the rule that all students who had the means went to Egypt to complete their education. The fact that history fails to supply a full account of this type of immigration might be due to some or all of the following reasons. A. The immigration laws against the Greeks up to the time of King Amasis and the Persian invasion. B. Prose history was undeveloped among the Greeks during the period of their educational immigration to Egypt. C. The Greek authorities persecuted and drove students of philosophy into hiding and consequently, D. Students of the mystery system concealed their movements. Let us remember that Anaxagoras was indicted and imprisoned, and that he escaped and fled to his home in Ionia, that Socrates was indicted, imprisoned, and condemned to death, and that both Plato and Aristotle fled from Athens under great suspicion. 2. The Effects of the Conquest of Egypt by Alexander the Great A. As elsewhere mentioned, it was an ancient custom of invading armies to loot libraries and temples in order to capture books and manuscripts, which were regarded as great treasures. A few instances would be enough to verify this custom. A. We are informed that during the Persian invasion beginning with Cambyses, the temples of Egypt were not only stripped of their gold and silver, but rifled for their ancient records. Every Egyptian temple carried a secret library with secret manuscripts and books. B. We are also informed that when Athens was captured by the Romans in 84 BC, the library of books said to have belonged to Aristotle was also captured and taken to Rome. Just as the invasion of Egypt by the Persians, the invading army stripped the temples of their gold, silver, and sacred books. And just as the capture of Athens by the Romans, Sulla carried off the only library of books which he found, so it is to be expected of Alexander the Great in his invasion of Egypt. One of the first things that he and his companions and armies would do would be to search for the treasures of the land and capture them. These were kept in temples and libraries and consisted of gold and silver, out of which the gods and ceremonial vessels were made, and sacred books and manuscripts kept both in libraries and in the holy of holies of temples. It is my firm belief that this indeed was the great opportunity which Alexander gave Aristotle and enabled him and his pupils to carry off as many books as they wanted from the royal library and to convert it into a research center. Apart from the royal library at Alexandria, there was also another famous library nearby, the Royal Library of Thebes the Meneptian, which was founded by Pharaoh Setei. The Meneptian was completed by Ramses II, but little occurs in history about this greatest of Egyptian royal libraries. However, any invading army would first loot the royal library of Alexandria and then would turn their attention to the Meneptian at Thebes. They would also visit the cities of Memphis and Heliopolis and likewise loot their libraries and temples. This was the ancient custom and certainly one of the ways in which the Greeks received their education from Egyptians. It is therefore an erroneous belief that the Greeks, on Egyptian soil and through their own native ability, set up a great university at Alexandria and turned out great scholars. On the other hand, since it is a well-known fact that Egypt was the land of temples and libraries, we can see how comparatively easy it was for the Greeks to strip other Egyptian libraries of their books in order to maintain the new library at Alexandria after it had been already looted by Aristotle and his pupils. The Greeks, i.e. Alexander the Great, Aristotle's school, and succeeding Ptolemies converted the Royal Library of Alexandria into a research center by transferring Aristotle's school and pupils from Athens to this great Egyptian library, and therefore the students who studied there received instructions from Egyptian priests and teachers until they died out. The difficulty of language and interpretation made it imperative for the Greeks to use Egyptian teachers. The Greeks did not carry culture and learning to Egypt, but found it already there and wisely settled in that country in order to absorb as much as possible of its culture. B. The Royal Library of Thebes, the Meneptian, is described. It was also looted by invading armies. But when we read of a brief sketch of the magnificence of the Theban Royal Library, the Meneptian, we even see a better picture and are bound to admit that Egypt was the storehouse of ancient culture and that the culture was preserved in the form of literature stored away in her great libraries and temples. Great as the Royal Library of Alexandria might have been, we see in the Theban Royal Library something far more magnificent and far more representative of the true greatness of our ancient Egypt. Okay. All right. So you see what what is, you know, it's kind of, we want to sound like it's repeat, repetitive, but it's, it's what it was, you know, uh, and he's bringing it in from 
every angle to to tell us you know shows how the relationship between what one society was and what after conquest what another become out of it and and you know it's just it's just reality what of what happened and we cannot pretend that things fall, fell out of the sky it it uh, it happened even during, during even before alexander went here it, um, egypt came under pressure from other societies other cultures and they were able to shake them off and then alexander came and knocked them over and even even alexander after alexander took over um other people came and took over from them and uh, the greeks had developed themselves and into an army and they themselves took over egypt now i think i mentioned this before that greece never really had anywhere um they never had it. they were a wandering people so can you imagine how they found they find this very they have conquered this very wealthy land beautiful you know everything is great buildings culture um the the the, the sense of knowing how to produce food and because you know we, we read about the egyptians they, they could feed the rest of the world for seven years when the when parts of the earth went through a famine and Egypt, they had enough food to feed the people for those. They were able to store enough food to feed people coming from all over, in, you know, um, the world. The, mainly like in the, you know, in that uh, North North Africa era, and I guess people that have been coming from parts of Europe too, because you know they weren't that far apart from it. It was quite close to um, to, to to Greece, and it's a matter of a, you know a, a boat ride or a ship ride across the Channel. I think I have a picture of that I want to put up here for a quick second. Um, yeah, this right, I don't know if my thing, you can see this here is um, Egypt down at the bottom and see up here, this is this is up in the, the what they call it? The, no, they say Athens, Greece. That is maybe, the, I think that's the capital of Greece right now. So they were able to travel across the water and get up there very fast. I think it's about 290 miles away. So it's not that far. It's almost probably something like you'd be from, say, Florida or something like that. And um, from Jamaica to Florida, let me put it this way. And um, and things. So, you know, they they, they 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 had access over land also. You know, they, they could travel across parts of, you know, up into Lebanon and other things and come back around and come down into Europe. But more than likely, the, 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 um, they, by then, a lot of ships were you know traversing the waters and the greeks became known for for, for sailing too and um and so that's how the reality of the thing was um did i come to these two oh, yeah i think i did that let me do oh by the way before i go you know i'm gonna have, have one more clip i'm gonna do i just want to again appeal to you if you like the program when you come up in it and you'd like to see more of this please like it please comment and please share and also subscribe you know it helps to grow the channel the channel is growing nicely i'm going to ask when you go you just touch that thumbs up um button um hit that subscribe button and also the notification button please hit the notification button because this there and it's very important i'm going to take this back down because it's blocking me and where is it yeah let me take it back down right you you know you hit the notification button hit the subscribe button hit write a little you know if you feel like if you're up to it i want to leave a little note to say what you think about the program i want to again say really you know thanks a big thanks to all those people who participated in last week's program it was great it left a good nice feeling and it, some good comments it wasn't just people just say i like it i like it but we're making some good, strong comments. I hope some of you will find it this week but, uh, and, and listen to it again because it, it's connected to Europe. And, and last week's thing, you know, was heavily um, Euro, Eurocentric between Russia and the, the rest of um, Europe. Um, again, let me do this last one and then get ready to wrap up. We even see a better picture and are bound to admit that Egypt was the storehouse of ancient culture and that the culture was preserved in the form of literature stored away in her great libraries and temples. 
Great as the Royal Library of Alexandria might have been, we see in the Theban Royal Library something far more magnificent and far more representative of the true greatness of our ancient Egypt. On the left of the steps leading to the second court, there is still seen the pedestal of the enormous granite statue of Ramses, the largest that has ever existed in Egypt, according to Diodorus. Its height has been calculated at 54 feet and its weight at 887 quarter tons. A marvel to the modern mind. The interior face of the wall of the pylon represents the wars of Ramses III. The oricide pillars of the second court are the monolithial figures, 16 cubits in height, supplying the place of columns. And at the foot of the steps leading from the court to the next hall beyond, there were two sitting statues of the king. The head of one of these was of red granite, known by the name of Young Memon, was taken away by Belzoni and is now a principal ornament of the British Museum. Beyond this are the remains of a hall 133 feet broad by 100 feet long, supported by 48 columns, 12 of which are 32 feet in height and 21 feet in circumference. On the different parts of the columns and the walls are represented acts of homage by the king to the principal deities of the Theban pantheon and the gracious promises which they make him in return. In another sculpture, the two chief divinities of Egypt invest him with the emblems of military and civil dominion, i.e. the scimitar, the scourge, and the pedum. Beneath the 23 sons of Ramses appear in procession bearing the emblems of their respective high office in the state, their names being inscribed above them. Nine smaller apartments, two of them still preserved and supported by columns, lay behind the hall. On the jams of the first of these apartments are sculptured Thoth, the inventor of letters, and the goddess Saf, with the title of Lady of Letters, and president of the Hall of Books, accompanied the former with an emblem of the sense of sight and the latter of hearing. There is no doubt that this is the sacred library which Diodorus describes in the inscribed Dispensary of the Mind. It had an astronomical ceiling in which the 12 Egyptian months are represented, with an inscription from which important inferences have been drawn respecting the chronology of the reign of Ramses III. On the wall is a procession of priests carrying the sacred arts, and in the next apartment, the last that now remains, the king is presenting offerings to the various divinities. C. Museum and the Library of Alexander were used as a university. The Museum and Library of Alexandria were so famous in ancient times that we wonder why more information concerning this center of learning has not come down to us. A few references to authoritative sources might no doubt help to enlighten us on this matter. From Sedgwick's and Tyler's History of Science, Chapter 5, pages 87 through 119, we learn that the subjugation of Egypt by Alexander the Great in 330 BC had checked the further development of, of Greek civilization on its native soil that after the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC, his vast empire was divided among his generals and that Alexandria, the new Egyptian capital, fell to Ptolemy. That the city, barely 10 years old, soon became the center of the learned world and that by 300 BC, the museum, i.e. the seat of the muses, was founded and became a veritable university of Greek learning. That to the museum was attached a great library with a dining hall and lecture rooms for professors and this became a school of philosophers, mathematicians, and astronomers. Here for the next 700 years, science had its chief abiding place. All right, <laughs> Let's, um, you're back. All right, so with that, um, that I, I just wanna go back over to say that the reason for this program this evening is to kind of show the relationship of how a lot of things that we have come to know that were given or claimed or taken by others were actually, they actually came from Egypt in Africa. A lot of people, when they hear the word Egypt, they don't think it's, it's Africa. It came from Egypt in Africa and the African continent. It's in North Africa. And they, that is, and what, what we were um, listening to is a, a reading from a book by a man named George G. M. Beckford. He wrote this book, he calls it The Stolen Legacy. Legacy, The Stolen Legacy, The Legacy of Egypt. It was conquered by Europeans, um, namely Alexander the Great and some others and, and, um, and the Greeks conquered it. And after they conquered it, apparently 
they settled in in the because they didn't the Greeks will really never owned anywhere, they never have good in you know, the place of abide. Um, I guess they were always being harassed. So they they moved into into Egypt and occupied. So we're looking at things like mathematics, where it came from, Egypt, astronomy, where it came from, Egypt, astrology, algebra came from Egypt. When we talk about the Pythagoras theory, theorem, it came, it all came from Egypt. But each, for some strange reason, they these other countries have claimed the, these things to be their own. These other people have claimed it to be their own because they went there and they conquered and they took because it was a practice of the period. Even now, today, it is a practice of war. When you when you they, when you conquer a place, the the conqueror takes the spoils, as they say. The, the, the conqueror takes the spoils. And so the same thing it was back in the early days. They took the spoils of Egypt and they claimed it because Egypt was a society thousands of years old and they developed all kinds of science and technology and astrology and mathematics and engineering and farming and all the, the accounting, all of these things they developed. But when they were conquered, I think what hurt Egypt they had a lot of infighting. So now every time I see some countries and they're constantly fighting each other and the infighting, we saw it happening in Sub-Saharan Africa too, the constant fighting and the constant capturing and the constant selling off ourselves and into slavery, we became weakened and people after a while, they didn't bother to even try to take us into slavery. They just came onto the old country and said, everything here is mine. We still hear France stuck in, they have it stuck in their head that France is still saying Africa belongs to, to, to France. And the Africans are now asserting themselves, they're rising up and they say, oh, hey, France, you got this wrong. Africa is for the Africans. So you go back to, to France and stay in France. So what we were doing is to show you how the things that were created in Egypt were claimed by the conquerors, claimed by the, the Greeks to say, they claim themselves that they Pythagoras and they claim themselves with Socrates and Plato and Asagoras and, and all these names that came up, you know, to say they are philosophers and they're astronomers and they're even music, music. Some of these people went there, they say, they say uh, <laughs> Pythagoras learned music in, in Egypt. And when they learned these things, they took it back to Europe. And then Europe became this place where we think they are, Oh, they are the you know cultured people, but they brought it all from Africa, from Africa then, from Egypt, and, and and so this is what we're trying to do is to highlight one of the things that they said in one of the very earliest clip is that they said the thing is to try to get people to understand that if you, I should probably should play that clip and not try to bring it out of my. Let me play this must be borne in mind that the first lesson in the humanities is to make a people aware of their contributions to civilization. And the second lesson is to teach them about other civilizations. By this dissemination of the truth about the civilization of individual peoples, a better understanding among them and a proper appraisal of each other should follow. This notion is based upon the notion of the great master mind. Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Consequently, the book is an attempt to show that the true authors of Greek philosophy were not the Greeks, but the people of North Africa commonly called the Egyptians, and the praise and honor falsely given to the Greeks for centuries belonged to the people of North Africa, and therefore to the African continent. Consequently... All right, I just did that little part just to bring us back to where we started. Um, the book is still available out there. It's, it's a book that was put out many, many years ago. But it's very much relevant, and it's a book called The Stolen Legacy, and it's by this man called George G. M. Beckford. And he is the one who kind of did a lot of research, and he, he just picked apart all of the people who left the, the impression that these works belong, these creations, these um, science and technology belong to the, 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 um, the Greeks. But if you look at the development in Egypt, the size of the structures, the kind of mathematics that had to go into, go into building those structures and to making them be standing up to this day after thousands of years when most other places, hundreds of years pass and the, the things crumble. What these 
Egyptians did. They are still standing as evidence to say there was a great people here once. Nothing, none of what they do has been um, duplicated. Of course, we do do tall buildings now, but it's based off of the the, the mathematics that he left behind, the algebra, the, the geometry that the, the, the Egyptians left behind, and we just you know have to understand that that this is part of you know it belongs to humankind period but what Beckford is saying is that we have to understand that when you share and the knowledge that all races made a contribution everybody will start respecting each other and one will not look down on one set to the point where you're a man, a man calling people dogs no animals calling and a man who's seeking to become a leader calling people animals that's total disrespect that kind of thing will lead to genocide we see it happen it happened in in, in several places in the earth but one of the last ones was in um uh, rwanda where so one side was calling the other one all kind of insects and roach and you know animals and, thing, and the next thing you know we had a genocide on our hand so again i want to thank everybody who will come across this program who have been hanging out watching and keeping quiet i know quite a few people in the background they're keeping quiet and I appreciate you. And I wanted to say we look forward to, the, to another one coming up soon. Um, I'm straying away from the Jamaican local politics for a little bit. Give it, give some people ears a break. You know, give them something different to listen to, and uh, and to present some good information that is out there that is not being talked about. And I just want to say again, please share it, like it, subscribe to it, and hit the note the notation notification button. All right. Until the next time, I want to say thank you. And this is Stafford Perkins tuning out. And here we go with my closing, my outro. Right